So continuing First Peter chapter 5, um, Paul's encouraging the elders who, you know, they have a little bit more experience, um, not necessarily experience of just, yeah, I've been a Christian for 20 years and, you know, I've been attending, you know, the institutional church and I've been serving here. No, it's the, the experience of, you know, seeing your death with Christ. There's a, you, you see you're cutting off of your strength to try to produce anything for God, which is the picture of circumcision. You've seen the reality of what baptism is, is you've seen your death with Christ, that you're dead to the law. You're, you reckon yourself dead indeed to sin's lordship over you. And you recognize that you've died to the religious world and the world to you, just as scripture tells us, um, as Paul tells us. And um, it's that experience of, um, you know, seeing that in this flesh dwells no good thing. Because um, you can go to a religious institutional church for 20 years and serve for 20 years, but be in dead works and be under the milk of the word and have a badge of the flesh. So the, the elder really is um, uh, having the mind of Christ. You, you're, you're actually suffering because of the grace of God, because of the testimony of Christ, that you have nothing to boast about but the blood. And you're seeking to, um, you know, point people to the finished work of Christ, seeking to set people free in the liberty of Christ, because you have also um, been enjoying Christ yourself. You're feasting on Christ. You know how to enjoy Christ in the word. And the truth, who is Christ, has set you free. And you know how to set your mind on the things of the spirit, which is to believe the gospel. And you know how, um, you know who, a true believer is through acknowledging them by the testimony of Christ. We go by the person and finished work of Christ. And you know that you're a sheep too. You're not above anyone. That's the elder. And he's saying, hey, elder, <laughs> you're also going to receive the crown of glory that fades not away. It's all part of our inheritance, the incorruptible inheritance that fades not away. Um, it's not something that you have to earn. He's not saying that you, only the elders earn these things, you know. Like some Christians believe that only certain people, you know, earn certain crowns and other people don't because they interpret the Bible um, based on the law. They're looking at themselves to try to earn a blessing because um, they're veiled by the law and they're, they're not beholding Christ as an image, um, revealing Christ from glory to glory. And Christ is the radiance of the Father, the exact uh representation of the father and christ in me the hope of glory and you're experiencing the crown of glory that <laughs> you're experiencing what you already have in christ every time you turn to god through faith in the blood of christ every time you experience persecution through faith in, in the blood of christ that's your testimony that's all you have that, like abel you all, all he presents is the blood um that's all we have Christ is a sacrifice. He's the sweet swelling aroma to the Father. We present him. I'm not trying to make myself more sweet smelling through my religious performance um, and to, and in, a, in its boast and its works. No, that's dead. That's the religious world. That's corruptible. That's all going to fade away, the glory of man. No, we present Christ, not our works. And we um, acknowledge another believer by the blood as well. And so... Christ is our reward, and there is no crown apart from Christ. He is the one that has the crowns on his head, and he's just sharing what he has with us because we're in him, and we're heirs and joint heirs together with Christ. He's the, the one to whom all the promises are made. He is heir of all things. All things are made, made by him, through him, for him, and without him nothing is made that was made, and in him all things consist. So he's encouraging the elders who are actually ministering the manifold grace of God as a good steward. You're just ministering what you already have, and it's an enjoyment. You're not doing things to earn a blessing, to, to, you know, to earn a wage, um, to, to perform before the pastor, perform before man, perform before God. No, you're just enjoying. You're dispensing what you have as a steward of the manifold grace of God. So he says in verse Five, likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Ye, all of you, be subject to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. So now he's also speaking to the younger. 
um, there's, there's those that, um, Paul says that, hey, there's those who are novice, who are a novice in the word, and they're puffed up with a head knowledge, and they desire to be teachers of the law. And they're not going to submit to the elder who's, who knows the grace of God. Um, because they think that the younger person thinks that he, he knows what's up. You know, I've overcame all this and that, and this person just keeps talking about grace. No, they're, they're zealous. There's these younger people that are really zealous and they have, they're under every wind of doctrine and their ears are tickled by hyper charismatic movements, you know, these hyper revival movements and just an external manifestation of a over idealistic look of what Christ, a Christian life looks like. And they're listening to all these different pastors and teachers, um, very Pentecostal, all about the externals, and they, they're they very zealous in their pursuit, quote-unquote pursuit of God through a law-based, um, legal, le- mystical, legalistic life. And they're not going to submit to um, an elder who's under the grace of God and who knows, um, you know, what true ministry is. And there's a hidden... Um, secret life before the Lord and it's not an external uh, boast like the younger people like to boast about um, you know they, they like to perform before man no so he's like hey younger submit yourself to the elder the elder who the true elder um, who actually knows the manifold grace of God and who's there to point you to Christ who's our chief shepherd who leads us into rest the younger believer doesn't understand that at first they're so zealous after the after the law typically they have gained all this knowledge and they they, they, they boast in it no you no submit to the elder the true elder and he's like hey we're all brothers and sisters in christ ain't no one's above anyone the elder's not above you there's that's not a title we're brother is brother and sister is the highest you know position that you can ever have not pastor not teacher not evangelist, not missionary, like the institutional churches boast about. No, it's brother. If you're in Christ, God sees you as Christ. You're in him. You're a brother. You're accepted in the beloved. He's not ashamed to call you his brethren. That's the highest um, position you're going to be. You're seated together with Christ Jesus in the heavenly places. Get your eyes off the earthly and get your eyes on Christ. You're a joint heir with him. And so we're subject to one another. You're not above anyone. And be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Um, even if you think that you, you, you know, you've accumulated some time in service, you're a veteran. You know, these younger people need to listen to me. No, you're not an elder. <laughs> you haven't accumulated anything. You, you're, you, you're still, um, you know, you're not walking in the true circumcision. You, you still have f- strength in your flesh. You need to be touched on your hip like, um, Jacob, you know, he was wrestling with God. You know, I need to earn my blessings. I earn something and people need to respect me. No, you need to get touched in the hip. You need to be weak. See, you need to see that you are weak and you need the grace of God. You don't need people to try to submit to you. No, you need to, you need to humble yourself before the Lord. Rest in the grace of God. Humble yourselves, therefore, verse six, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. You, right now is not the time of exaltation and trying to earn some sort of badge of the flesh, some sort of religious identity before man here, trying to prove to everyone how spiritual you are. No, right now is our time of humility. If you're really actually walking in godliness, you know, walking according to the spirit, walking in righteousness, the Bible says that uh, how can the two walk together unless they agree? Walking and godliness is agreeing with what godliness is. It's the person and finished work of Christ, First Timothy tells us. It's the gospel. Walking according to righteousness is walking according to the righteousness of Christ. He is my righteousness. I'm putting him on display, not me. Again, holiness. Christ in me, the hope of glory. It's the holy of holies where the veil is torn, where you've entered by faith in the blood of Christ. You've entered into rest and ceased from your dead works. Service is presenting Christ. He is my sanctification. He is renewing my mind with himself, and I'm at ease before the Lord. My conscience is at ease before the Lord. I'm not trying to, there's no competition before man. I'm not trying to, you know, I want other people to see how spiritual I am through, you know, trying to pursue, 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 and I want everyone to see, like, 
how holy and spiritual I am. No, that's that needs to die, bro. That's the whole picture of baptism, dude. That needed that needed to die already at the cross. It's crucified. God doesn't want that. That's your flesh. That's religious dead works before man. That there's a flow of pure pressure right now. It's a, a drunkenness of self exaltation before man, and you want other people to see. Wow, look how holy and spiritual you are. I need to get like you. You know, I'm on fire. You know, it's all fleshly zeal, and you want other people to see how holy you are. And you're not putting Christ on display. You're putting yourself and your religious dead works on display. Now humble yourself. We He will exalt us on that day. We he already sees us exalted with him in the heavenly places in Christ. So we're we're not trying to appear more religious, more spiritual than we are right now. You you just abide in Christ. Just rest in Christ. Okay, we people Christians have this over idealistic mindset because it's performance based because they're under false teaching of what Christianity looks like, and it's usually typically uh, very. Um, mystical, legalistic, and they're they have a lot of spiritual OCD, performance based, and they're, they're under James two, they're under Matthew seven, they're under the earthly teachings of Christ when he's teaching the law of the impossibility of discipleship. Um, they're under false teachers who, um, you know, their kingdom now theology where they're trying to, you know, call down the heaven of God and bring down the kingdom of God here. We need to establish it here. I mean, these are false revivals and. It's very, it's a drunkenness, actually, following all these quote-unquote rapture watchers and their news updaters, and and they have something to boast about. They're identifying with this person and that person, this movement and that movement, and there's no Christ. There is no Christ in him crucified. And Paul says, hey, look, I came to you in weakness. I don't preach myself. I preach Christ in him crucified. Um... The carnality is a religious carnality, and there's it's filled with self exaltation. And the true believer who's actually walking in godliness and righteousness and holiness is we don't have anything to boast about but Christ and crucified, and we want to be found in Him, not having a righteousness of, of our own, which is out of the law, it's a faded glory but that which is of God based on faith in Christ Jesus. There, there is no righteousness apart from the righteousness of Christ. The righteousness of the law only testifies and witnesses the righteousness of Christ. And, and he who tries to pursue the righteousness of the law, it's not a faith. It only points to the righteousness of God, which is Christ. And um, it's a faded glory if you try to pursue the law. Um, thou shalt love the Lord God. Oh, I want to show everyone that I'm loving God with all my heart, so my strength, loving my neighbor as myself. That's the law. You're not living up to it. You're putting yourself under the curse of it. And you're not pleasing God. You're not pleasing God. Because the only thing that pleases God is Christ and crucified, his finished work. And it's faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So exalt Christ. Exalt the cross. And see your death with Christ. We come in weakness. The The... the Christian life and its true fruit is produced through just abiding in Christ and it's in our weakness. We have nothing to boast about. We are weak and it's in our weakness we find his strength. Uh, my strength is made perf perfect in your weakness. My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness, not in your self-exaltation and your pursuit of God. Like that, all the people are, oh, my, my pursuit of God, he's not pursuing God, I'm pursuing God. No, you're not. Your pursuit of God is, is, is you're just trying to pursue a religiosity before man. It's called covetousness, like the Pharisees pursued God. The pursuit of God is the pursuit of the knowledge of Christ, being found in him, not having a righteousness of our own, but to know him and just to taste and see that he's gracious. I don't have to tell anyone what I'm doing. No, it's a secret and quiet place before the Lord where you're just quietly abiding in him. And he sees the fruit. It's the fruit of Christ. And it's going to come out in your speaking. You're not going to speak yourself or put yourself on display, making yourself seem more holy, thinking that you're a light to the world. No, you're just putting yourself on display. Um, but God, God sees the heart. Um, okay. There's a drunkenness that we want to come out from among that, that religious 
world and see our death with it and really rest in Christ and really have a good conscience before the Lord, which is faith in the blood. Um, who do I have on this earth but you? And what else do I desire but you? Even though my heart, my flesh, my fell, you're the strength of my heart and you're my portion forever. You're my reward. I'm not trying to earn anything here. I'm not trying to earn something before you. Put you in my debt. I'm not indebted to please anyone. No, you're the one that's pleasing to the Father and I'm hidden with you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Casting Verse 7, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. Just, Lord, I give it to you. I'm going to stop wrestling with this. There's a lot of things that we can wrestle with, man. And a lot of it is a religious performance that causes us to get frustrated with God because the law, the Bible says that the, the law worketh wrath. If I do this, then God will bless me. And if I don't, then, then I'm not well-pleasing before the Lord. That's the law mindset. You have to cast all that before the Lord. Cast it upon Christ. He cares for you. And he cares about your health. He cares about your your walk, he wants you to be healthy. A healthy walk before him is a walk that's nourished with Christ. That Christ is really your food and drink, that you're actually eating and drinking Christ. And the, the New Testament ministry, where Christ is your high priest, where you know that he abides in you and you in him, you're not far from him. And he, he wants, he gives himself freely to you as your food and drink. So when you start wrestling with God, trying to earn something from God, earn blessings from God, from your performance, and you give it up, you see, and a lot of the trials will bring you to that place. That's God's discipline. It's not because you've sinned. God's discipline is an instruction to bring you to his grace, to not go back to dead religion. That's willful sin, to go back to men's men performance, man's performance in religion, playing the circus game, dead religion, offering up this and that to be more pleasing to God. Okay, now I, I, I did the church thing. Now I'm pleasing to God. No, it's when you see that, okay, I'm outside the camp and Christ is the one sacrifice and offering. He's perfected forever us who he has sanctified. He's my sanctification. And what pleases God is faith in the blood. That is the place where he wants you to be at, where you're entering to rest daily, preaching the gospel to yourself, knowing that he cares for you. And that's where he wants us to be. Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Stop wrestling and start, and start resting in Christ. Give it to him. I give it to you, Lord. You're my life. You're, you don't expect anything out of me. It's, instead, you see the opposite. You just want Christ, you want Christ to live in me and through me. And that's just a walk of faith. The just really shall live by faith. Um, the Bible says in Romans 1 that, uh, for I'm not ashamed, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for his the power of God unto salvation for those who believe, first the Jew and the Gentiles. And then he says, in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. The just shall live by faith. The, the way that we live righteously is revealed from faith to faith, not from faith to dead works, not from faith to religion, not from faith to the law, faith to anything but faith to faith. Okay? It goes against our religious flesh that wants to do something to try to please God. No. And so the trials are bring us to that place of brokenness and weakness. That brings us to the grace of God. That's his discipline. He, the Father wants you to see Christ and to rest in him. He is your life and length of days. I'm not trying to live, to imitate Christ. No, not I, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Abraham, he believed in the promise of God, that God counts those things that are not as though they are, and that God gives life to the dead. Okay, God's going to produce it. We're not trying to strive for it, just abide, which is to believe the gospel and have confidence before him. And when he appears, we are not going to shrink back in shame. How do you know that you're shrinking back in shame? Well, you're afraid of God. You think that you're indebted to God, indebted to men. Your consciousness is restless. You feel like if you don't do certain things, then God's angry at you. And if you do certain things, then God's happy with you. No, cast all your care before him. He cares for you. He's for you, not against you. Be sober, verse 8. Uh, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist at fast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So there is a sobriety. This is the third time um, Peter's mission to be sober. 
the first time he was like, hey, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and rest, hope um, to the grace of God, which is, which is the revelation of Christ. There's a sobriety, um, which is having your mind focused on Christ, letting your mind be renewed in the gospel and the grace of God, letting Christ be revealed to you in the word. We're coming to the word and seeing Christ. His low I come and the volume of the book speaks of me. We're not trying to find something to do, instruction to do. You know, we, we, we're, we want to see who Christ is in us and who he is to us and what we have in him. And our mind is renewed in the gospel. That's what the word, word should bring us into, a deeper knowledge of the fr- full assurance of faith. That's what it means to be steadfast in the faith. Satan wants you to be um, focused on any other thing but Christ. Um, and he'll use spiritual language and, and teachers who sound spiritual to get your eyes on your flesh, your religious performance, uh, this false teacher, that false teacher, every wind of doctrine but Christ. Um, you know, hyper charismatic, all these different things, you know, all the things that the religious world um, propagates of how it looks, you know, how you should be looking like a Christian. <laughs> it's all law based and it's it's not rooted in New Testament ministry. So be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So Satan's coming to bring you back into religion. He will use religion, he'll use your virtues, he'll use your. Um, you know, your, your pursuit, your zealous pursuit of God against you to pull you away from Christ. He'll do anything uh, to pull you away from Christ, from your rest in Christ. Jesus like, hey, hold fast to what you have. Let no one steal, you know, your crown. Um, Paul's like, hey, let no one count you unworthy, judge you unworthy of your prize, who is Christ, your enjoyment, your confidence before Christ right now. Um, so steadfast in the faith is believe in the gospel and know that hey, there's those in the world like Peter and Paul, um, Timothy, it, it, there, there is a remnant of believers who are resting in the grace of God, who are speaking New Testament ministry, who have seen our death with Christ, who are, who are also experienced the afflictions. Um, most of the afflictions, again, is from the religious world. Jesus said, if the world hated me, what world? The Pharisees, the religious world. The, the world hated me don't be afraid don't be shocked that it's gonna hate you peter's like hey don't don't think it's strange when the fiery trial is trying you something strange is happening to you okay um it's gonna happen to you (laughs) because you're resting in christ people hate the testimony of christ there's spiritual warfare cain hated abel cain thought that his works and his fruit were pleasing to god but only god accepts the blood abel presented the blood again the bond woman, Ishmael and Hagar, persecuted the children of the promise. <laughs> Isaac, Sarah, Abraham, who are sinners, who knew that we're sinners, who we have faults, and we have nothing to boast about. Um, but we have to just count, hey, look, God calls those things that are not as though they are. He gives life to the dead. And we walk strong in faith <laughs> through seeing our weakness. And we have nothing to boast about but Christ. He's our answer. We don't have to justify ourselves before man. Um, you know, we talked about how, um, you know, Ham buffeted Noah for his faults and he wanted to find fault in him in his, in his spiritual walk. And, you know, this is, this is our leader, this is our dad. It's really the testimony because it, Noah had the testimony of Christ, the seed that was to come in the world. He knew that he needed propitiation for his sins. Ham thought he was uh, a good person, better than Noah. And so he wanted to make Noah look worse and Ham better. He's like, hey, look. That's us, though. We're, we're like Noah. We're like, you know, we're, we're the ones who have faults. We're the ones who have nothing to boast about. We're, we're Abraham and Sarah. We, yeah, we're weak. We're Paul. We, 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 we come in weakness. Uh, you know, we're, we have nothing to boast about. We're the reproach of man. We're not, we're not the person who's trying to look more spiritual than others. Who trying to try? I'm not as bad as you think I am, you know. And justifying ourselves, you know, you know, you know, my heart, my heart really isn't like that. It's like no, our heart's wicked, dude. We, we need the righteousness of Christ. He is our righteousness. He is our sanctification. He is our reward. I have nothing. It, there's nothing but the blood of Christ, dude. Like it's it's literally it's legit. It's not a false humility. You know, we're trying to. I'm I'm just such a servant. You know, I'm washing people's feet and I'm doing this and that and. 
You know, look at, look at me. I'm giving. That's a false humility, dude. It's all about self. No, what true humility is presenting Christ. That we don't even know what humility is apart from Christ. God manifested in the flesh. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He became sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We don't know what humility is, but until Christ revealed it to us, he came down in weakness and, and, and flesh, even though with, apart from sin, but he suffered and bore our sin upon himself, condemned sin in his flesh, was spat upon, was crucified for our sins and rose from the grave for our justification. And so humility is presenting Christ, man. And so we're going to experience the same afflictions when we present Christ, not us. We have nothing to boast about. Not our religious attendance, no. But not, not me giving something to God, giving my life to the Lord. I surrendered everything. No, you didn't. Christ surrendered everything for us, dude. You're going to get persecuted. And hey, look, Satan just wants you to be co go back to all that and to do dead religion, to present something else other than the blood. But hey, look, there's other people that are suffering too. And Christ, when Christ who is our life is revealed, we will reveal, be revealed with him in glory. And everything that is built on the corrupt, incorruptible materials, gold, silver, precious stones, everything that Christ is rotting in you and impressing in you through the sufferings will be revealed on that day. His glory is going to be revealed on that day. Um, and everything that you know, it's wood, hay, and stubble, and your dead, and people's dead religion, their own glory is all going to be burned, man, which is good. Um, so there's other people that are experiencing it too. You're not alone in this believer who's resting in the grace of God, but the God of all grace, I love that, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, established, uh, which is confirm you, and strengthen and settle you. He wants to settle our conscience. All the fiery trials is to bring us to the place where Christ is real to me right now. Where all the corruptible things in this life that, that we our flesh likes to pursue and desires and lusts after, you know, all the religious lust and covetousness, all that <laughs> gets burned. He wants it to be burned now. He called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, God of all grace. We In Christ moment you are in christ which is to believe the gospel you're in him and then you're predestined there's a destination for the believer who's in christ you're called to his eternal his eternal glory we have everything if you have christ and so he wants our conscience to be settled the, perf the perfecting of our conscience is to be settled right right now through faith in his blood where you're walking according to the spirit where you're not experiencing the condemnation for years and years and weeks and days and days no but you're settled in christ now and you know the sufferings only show that the faith that you have the blood and the word all these incorruptible materials are real that we're just letting go of more and more of the dead religion and man performance and you trying to please god through your dead works all that gets burned man to the through the, the sufferings that you experience, the trials that we experience, just show that Christ is real to me right now, that he is my satisfaction, he's my joy, he's really what the one that I want in life. He is my life. Um, and he wants to establish us more and more in what we have in him and the inheritance that we have in Christ. He wants to settle us in his love for us. This is love, not that we love God, there's no demand on you, but that he first loved us. We love him, but because he first loved us. And the commandment is to believe in Christ and to love one another, which is objective in every believer. And that's why his yoke is easy, his burden is light, because he took the yoke, he took the burden. <laughs> uh, there is no demand on you. The demand is placed on Christ. He wants us to settle us in that truth, which is contrary to our religious flesh. Um... So to him be the glory, verse 11, and dominion forever and ever, amen. Christ is the head. All glory and dominion belongs to Christ. There is no glory that you can attain here. If you associate yourself with Christ, you, there is not going to be this external exaltation of glory. No, that's the, it's the opposite. His glory is being wrought in us. It's an inner weight of glory that he's riding in us as we look to the things that are unseen, not to the things that are seen by the, the religious eye. <laughs> no, if, if you're going to, 
you're you are a fragrance of christ and as you're actually enjoying christ people know it and it's going to come out when you speak so to christ be the glory and dominion forever and ever amen all glory belongs to christ um, the true glory is not after a pursuit after the law which is a faded glory but christ who is the reality who's writing himself in us in verse 12 by Silvanius, a faithful brother unto you, I suppose. I have written briefly, you know, love believes all things and hopes all things. And faithfulness is 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 believing the gospel right now. <laughs> Knowing that Christ is our faithful creator. He's already said, that, hey, I, you know, we can trust and trust our souls to our faithful creator. That's faithfulness. Is your, is is not that you're being faithful to do X, Y, and Z. I'm faithful, good steward. No, that's self-performance. Faithfulness is believing the gospel that Christ is our faithful one. And we're stewards of the manifold grace of God. Um, the true grace of God. Um, not to earn anything. Not to be a faithful steward. No. <laughs> because then you have to put yourself under, oh, then I'm a unfaithful steward. There's a possibility to be an unfaithful steward. No, again, it's always focused on the propitiation of Christ. Um, so he's just love is love. Agape love is believing all things. Um, hoping all th hopes all things endures all things christ's love for us never fails so that's why he's like hey a faithful brother unto you i suppose and i've written briefly exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of god where you stand because there's uh imitation grace that the legalists will present and they accuse grace as a license of sin but the true grace of god um, you know, when you're actually speaking the true gospel, you're going to be slandered, just like they slandered Christ, just as Paul was slandered for teaching a license of sin. Um, that's the true grace of God, because the gospel really is by believing. No, there isn't a license of sin. That's an accusation. Where sin abounds, his grace really does abound more. And when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, but we're not a slave to sin, nor are we a slave to the law. But the accusation itself of saying, oh, you're just looking for a license of sin, is comes from a person in unbelief who's actually looking for a license of sin themselves, like the older brother who who was angry at the prodigal son, his younger brother, who, you know, he, he, he was mad that his father slew him a fat feast the, and clothed him with a robe and a ring and the older brother's like, I've been keeping the commandments. You didn't throw me a feast. And the father's like, why are you mad? I, You could have had a feast the whole time. The father just wants his children to feast. Just as the father, our father wants us to feast on Christ, enjoy Christ. That's the true grace of God. It's not about don't do this, don't do not handle it, taste, don't touch. It has no hindrance on your indulgence of the flesh. That's what Colossians tells us. But to set our affection on Christ, to enjoy Christ, that's what he wants us to do is just to enjoy him. Enjoy the feast. Enjoy the riches of what you have in Christ. That's a, there's a part of our as, the aspect of our walk that according to the order of Melchizedek, he is that Christ is our high priest forever and he ministers himself to us as bread and wine, food and drink. That's forever. That's incorruptible that we can just abide in, just enjoy Christ. Rest, be settled in the love of God and, and, and enjoy Christ. Just read Galatians and Romans and feast on those truths, okay? And then everything else, all the rest of the scripture will, um, you know, open up to you. When you just, just enjoy Romans 1 through 8, how to do that. And enjoy Galatians and be set free. Understand what Paul's actually saying. Enjoy and enjoy the word. Don't try to do something, but enjoy Christ. Um... And then he says, verse 13, just to close out, the church that is in Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so does Marcus, my son. I greet you one another with a kiss of charity, agape love. I acknowledge one another by the testimony of Christ. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. You can't have peace without Christ. Romans 5, 1, having been justified by faith, I have peace with God through my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Right now, stand in justification. The peace of God rule in your heart. Um, and then the church that's in Babylon, I think that that's the code word, Babylon, but, you know, they're in Rome. But Babylon is the hub of everything that's evil, that everything that God hates. It's the, it's the hub of idolatry. And that's really the, the age that we're living in. That's the age that, you know, that Peter's speaking to right now. And it's really prophetic, Babylon. 
your only answer, you're in Babylon. All you can do is exercise faith in the blood. You know, we really are just strangers passing through here, man. And we look for a city and, and builders, the Lord. And, you know, we, we really want to walk by faith and not by sight. And so, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the end of First Peter. I hope this really edified you, um, whoever listens to this message.